Hey guys, before we start this episode, I wanted to talk to you about Type 1 Lifting. So Type 1 Lifting is a clothing line that proceeds of the shirts and tanks and everything else goes to the Children's Diabetes Foundation. So um, this all came about with me and seeing a five-year-old girl in the emergency department uh, that had a new onset of diabetes. So uh, just take a look at the website. It's www type1lifting.com so just check it out if you don't buy anything that's perfectly fine uh, I would just like for you just to take a look and just see what we have so like I said before www.type1lifting.com and guys I hope you enjoy the show All right, guys, welcome to another edition of the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. I have a three-time CrossFit Games athlete, two times team champion, co-owner of FNX, and brute strength coach, Adrian Conway. How's it going, man? It's it's fantastic. And now you're, you're, you're going to kill me here for this, but I'm going to correct you right out of the gate. I'm a, I'm a four-times game oh, athlete. Oh, that's right. I'm, I'm sorry. Three-time champ. Um so yeah, no, that's just a fun thing. You 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 mentioned it. Of course, those are those are amazing things to be a part of. Um, but I am I am thrilled to be here, man, to be a part of your show and get to hopefully you know inspire, educate, uh, and entertain a little bit of your audience, however I can. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I looked on the CrossFit website and that's like they only had the three on there. So that's that's my my fault. So CrossFit needs to step it. it up a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> hey, listen, you know, once Greg Glassman started pulling funds from the uh, media team, they probably really. Really find the, uh, the statistics too. So, yeah, <laughs> totally agree. So, um, I I did read a little bit. You you kind of like bounced around all over the place, but you were like mainly and you you playing team sports like basketball and football. So how did how did CrossFit come about? Yeah, that's a great question. So to be honest with you, I, I was a lifelong athlete. I, I was in love with football and basketball growing up. Um, it was a life. It was really, truly, and when I say this, I mean it, a lifelong goal to be a collegiate athlete and hopefully professional at some level. Either of those sports would have been awesome. Um, and I recognized that genetically, I was kind of more talented for the football route, so I stuck to that into my junior year of high school. Um, and I was, I was very focused in, in everything I did, training and all that. So I loved the gym because I was drawn to that. Right, I, I wanted to learn how I could run a faster forty and jump higher, so I could compete with guys from bigger schools or different areas. And so. Um, I was always a gym rat. I, I ended up getting that Division One scholarship. I played football at Weber State University here in Utah, which is home now to me. I yep. came here from Arizona, bounced around the United States growing up, so I'm a, I'm a bit of a military brat. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that being said, when I got to Weber State, I knew that there's that realistic potential that the NFL isn't going to happen for me. Um, and so I wanted to study something that kept me around sports, more importantly, kept me around athletics. I studied kinesiology there. Um, tremendously blessed to have a great career. I uh, got to play two years of arena football there. Never made it to the NFL. Um, and uh, certainly that was a disappointment, but it created a lot of other opportunities for me. Um, and because of that uh, degree in exercise science, I, from the time I was a sophomore, I'd been training people. So from a 19-year-old kid, I'd been training speed and agility, performance-based training with youth, mm -hmm. um, high school athletes, all those kind of people that wanted to basically do the same thing I was doing, right, pursue the next level. And uh, as I graduated and saw that, you know, I wanted to be more than just an athletic trainer per se mm -hmm. or a performance enhancement coach, I, uh, I started to dabble in what uh, certificate courses were available to me um, because at the time I was working for Weber State University and they each year paid for some continued education, which I was fortunately blessed because at the time, man, I could not afford $1,000 to pay for my CrossFit Level 1. Yeah. And, uh, and so I signed up for that, and that was really first exposure. Um, so I, I saw CrossFit there for what it really was, not just what people talked about what it was. And that's when I fell in love with the methodology, and I was like, they got a CrossFit Games. I want to try to compete in those things. Yeah. So you, you went to the Games in, uh, in 2012 with, uh, as a team with Hacks Pack, right? And so, yes, and, you, and you won the first, and that you won that that whole uh, the whole CrossFit game. So, what was that experience like? I know, obviously, you're, you played football and basketball. Like, how did you guys mesh as a team? And like, what's what was the communication like when you guys well, won the championship? 
Yeah, so it was a wonderful experience for me. And just to give everyone some context, it's like my desire was to be an individual athlete. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, I wasn't ready. And at the time where the sport was, it wasn't really going to pay off for me to just show up and be a guy that finished 30th at the CrossFit Games, right? Like, it would have been no recognition. No one would have remembered that I went. Mm -hmm. And so basically the pitch to our team from Tommy was like, hey, guys, there's a lot of us that could show up and be individuals on this team because we're that talented. However, if we show up together, we're going to win the CrossFit Games. So we, we, we literally just kind of pit, you know, uh, I, I would say singularly focused our mentality and mindset to doing just that was winning the cross game. So that was our expectation. Anything less would have been a disappointment. With that being said, you know, surrounded by tremendous talent, uh, Tommy Hackenberg himself, clearly second best man in the world in mm -hmm. 2009, yep. um, you know, been to the game several times. And uh, Michael Kaziu as well was our, was our other male who's one of our co-founders of Root Strength Training. Um, and just, just ridiculous uh, work capacity. And, and from the mental standpoint, really, really, um, you know, willing to suffer, mm -hmm. right? A lot more than a lot of other people. Um, and then, of course, on the female side, we had uh, Mary Lampus, uh, Taylor Richards Lindsay, and then Aaron Binion, whom all three actually were former Division One athletes at some capacity, whether it be soccer, whether it be cross country, whether it be um, basketball for Taylor. With that being said, our team was stacked. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, we were talented, but to bring everybody's personalities together and to, you know, become one comprehensive unit, that was a, that was a task in itself. We all led busy lives. Some of us were full-time coaches. Some of us, you know, some of the women were working in like nursing in, in the medical field. So they mm -hmm. weren't, we weren't able to train together three to four times a week. This was like once or twice a week, all in the same gym at the same time. Yeah. So we really had to make sure that we trusted each other. We were very connected in regards to text and Facebook, but it was all about, uh, you know, when we got a chance seeing each other, looking each other in the eyes and being honest about like, hey, are you putting in this work? Because if one of us felt like we were putting in the work and the others weren't, it would have never worked. So I think that built a lot of our trust. Yeah. And what did it feel like winning winning the team's division? Man, that first year, it was a sigh of relief. Right. <laughs> so I know that sounds weird. Not that it wasn't amazing because it was, but to paint the picture for the audience, guys, at this time, we were a very dominant force again, because like commonly what made up teams were people who maybe couldn't cut it as individuals. And here we were like people that actually thought we could make it as individuals, mm -hmm. but we wanted to be champions as a team. And so, you know, we ran away with most of that competition that year. However, Dave Castro pulled the rabbit out of his hat on the final event, just like he had done the previous year. He reset the scores to zero. And on the final event, like the top eight teams, it was winner take all. So even though we had this landslide margin of points we amassed throughout the course of three days, here we were fighting tooth and nail to get our championship that we felt like was owed to us at that point. Yeah. Um, and we made it happen. But so by the time we finished and that work got done, four times the set or the buzzer goes off, we were just like, oh, thank goodness. Like, I mean, <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. That's awesome. Now, in, uh, in 2015, you actually made it as an individual. And I think that was, that was the year when they had Murph for the first time, like during like the middle of – like middle of the middle of the summer, so and I, I actually talked to Nick Urankar about it too, and he he said it was like the most craziest workout, like especially in the middle of the day in Carson. So what was your uh, experience like with doing Murph? I loved every second of it. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so you know a little bit about me as an athlete specifically is that of course I come from a power background, so you know my talents really lie in short bursts of speed, um, heavier lifts, like as I found CrossFit. But then, of course, I spent the next year and a half, especially while I was on the team, two, like next two years, focused on endurance alone because that was such a glaring weakness for me. Mm -hmm. I had to develop skills, and I certainly had to learn a lot of gymnastics. So for me that year, to be honest, it was an opportunity for me to showcase what I had built over time. And, you know, the unique thing is, man, I finished seventh in that workout that year. And uh, as a guy over 200 pounds, the rest of the guys that beat me were like, you know, 185, 190 and um, I think what highlighted that was my humility at the start of the race. So a lot of people um, just came out way too hot. They yeah. let their emotions get the best of them. Of course, it's a hero workout. You're going to leave it all on the floor no matter what, whether there's people there watching you or not. I mean, mm -hmm. we want to pay our respect to Murph, of course. And, uh, you know, people came out smoking. I mean, it was crazy to hear what the splits were on that first mile. And here I come moseying my way in, I think, like, you know, 27th or 28th place out of 40 on this first run. And, uh and so with that being said, I was able to gain ground as people's heart rate started to get too high and they couldn't cool themselves down because it was so hot. Yeah. Right. So, I, and I, and I did like 100 of the pull-ups and sets of five, like I'm talking, I was taking my time 
But then one thing that's a strength of mine at this at this point in my career was the ability to do local muscle. I could do push-ups very well. I could do air squats very well. So I kind of flew through those two measures. And then that last mile for me was a strong suit because mm-hmm. of all the endurance I've been spending on. So to be honest with you, it was brutal. I loved every second of it. Um, I think the most memorable part is I, I passed Alex Anderson at the very end of the <laughs> workout in a sprint. And uh, I, I've given people the story before, but I, that was the one thing that I feared the most in that workout. I literally went into the workout like, look, I'll be good. I just don't want to have to race the last mile against someone Uh because you think about like, we knew we had like two more events that night, that day. We knew we had a whole nother two days of competition potentially at that point. And so I'm like, okay, this is all self-preservation here. I want to finish good, but like not that, you know, I don't want to kill myself to do it at this point. Yeah. But then man, I I pull into that tunnel. Someone, I pass a couple guys on my last mile, fortunately enough. And someone yells to me from the crowd, uh, someone's walking in front of you. And I'm like, Oh no. And so I'm like, okay, I just I try to catch up to him. And I turn the corner of that tunnel and he's walking. And then right when I turn the corner, he looks back at me. And so as he looks back at me, yep. I'm like, oh no. Like I was just hoping to sneak up on him, right? Like quietly and mm-hmm. be done. And I, and then he starts jogging a little bit. And so, oh man, then in my mind I had to I had to gamify this thing and figure out what strategy would work best to kind of lull him to hopefully give a little bit of speed too soon. And and it timed out just right. But it was a brutal workout yeah at least yeah so how did how did you recover throughout because i know you said you had like two other events that night so how did you recover throughout like the whole whole um, 2015 games just to get to where you were so so to be honest i did it poorly right? <laughs> so my, my, my work capacity was relatively high i have darker skin so the sun doesn't affect me as bad as the fair-skinned athletes like those things are truly advantages yeah I'm a huge sweater so I was able to keep myself cool versus like some of the athletes that didn't sweat as well. They literally went into over overheat and, 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 and some shock for some of them. Car Saunders, Annie mm-hmm. Dorstadt, or some of those girls. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, so I performed well in the workout. But then after my fueling was poor, man, and I didn't recognize that until another two years later. As we're getting ready to go back on a team in 2017 again. Um, when I learned more about, you know, my carbohydrate stores and how to keep my glycogen levels topped off and also the importance of electrolytes, because then it was just like, I was just pounding water and taking some protein shakes in, eating some fruits. And, you know, when you're going through that amount of physical stress, you don't want to eat. So if you didn't plan, like you're, you're going to be hurting. So I think, uh, that day I fared okay. I ended up taking eight in uh, heavy DT as well. Mm-hmm. So it was a good day for me at the games for sure. Um, but man, that next day and then the following day, I think I was really feeling the residuals of that those performances yeah. because of lack of fuel. Yeah. And uh, speaking about 2017, I know you guys started a team again. You went back to team and the whole like that whole year was hashtag stop mayhem. And so which I, I love I love that part. And so you guys won that year, too. And I love the I love the um, the second place where Rich Rich and his team were there and like his face was just like. He wasn't having it. So can you just tell me about like the, your uh, 2017 experience as a team again? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's, that's probably my favorite year. Yep. Um, you know, people ask me that question. It's very hard to say, but I think that was, and I think it was because, you know, I had come off of 2015 as an individual, a little banged up in 2016, but I didn't qualify that year. I was actually like seven points out from qualifying. I finished six that I need to get top five at our region that year. So, mm-hmm. um, I think I finished maybe right behind Elijah Muhammad that year if he punched the ticket. But actually, I think both of us didn't qualify that year. Both of us previously qualified. Long story short, I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. Um, and I'd been training in 2015 and 16 with several other great local athletes. So Mandy Janowitz, Tiffany Henderson, Michaela North, or all three of those women that were on our team. We trained together probably since 2013 as a group, but never on the same team. Yeah. And so – you know, uh, all three of them as well did not qualify to 2016 games and all three of them were at regionals. So that tells you how stout they were. Um, you know, Tiffany Hendrickson, formerly 11th fittest woman in the world in 2014. Manny Janowitz, formerly, I think, 24th in the world in 2014. Both of them there that year. Um, phenomenal Michaela North was literally a judge's decision away from qualifying the games in 2016 as an individual a year postpartum. Like, just phenomenal athletes yeah. right and again we're back to all division one mandy was a decathlete in track and field um michaela was a track athlete at weaver state university in track and field and tiffany was a gymnast um and then myself brennan fjord and mitch Spute were rounded up the guys side but i highlight the women so much because they carried us on their backs yeah honest with you right um and with that being said that year was amazing uh we literally made the decision to come together pretty early on okay uh, because of the state of where the teams were like you know rich and what they were doing like they won the game so handily in 2016 in regards to point accumulation 
that we know we knew that like one we had to make sure everyone was very healthy going into the games that year. And two, we had to make sure that everyone was focused on increasing in their weaknesses. Um, unfortunately for me, the experience of leading a team or being a part of a team with a great leader like Tommy Hackenbrook in 2012 and 2013, um, I, I remember how we needed to work together. Uh, the things that we needed to talk about, the things that we would say, the things that we wouldn't say, uh, the, the, the ways that I could check in on the girls to make sure that mentally they were confident and comfortable because it's very different working with women than it is men, uh-huh. right? And every personality is so different. So I think those are the things to our advantage. We built a ton of memories. And then the hashtag Stop the Mayhem actually came from the Bruce Strength crew. So, right, like Mike and uh, Matt Bruce, they're like, guys, we got to we gotta post Stop the Mayhem. We got to get some – they wanted to get some, you know, emotions tied in. Yeah. They wanted to put a show on. Yeah. Definitely not my style. Okay? <laughs> but, but I'm also glad we did it because it put a bullseye on us. You know, it really made us rise to the occasion. Um, and, of course, we get to the games. And Rich and I, I'm fortunate enough to have tripped down to Cookville a few times and trained with him over the years because I've worked across with Level 1s down there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course he's come up here to Utah to do some events. So we train together usually while he's here or when he was here previously. So, you know, we get there and we're chopping it up and he's just like, Oh, you guys had to make that, make that hashtag, huh? But he, he, he knew right away, like, and he brought it up and it was fun. And there was a lot of jaw jacking all weekend back and forth. Um, but yeah, man, what, what an experience. I, I think truly, and I say this to everyone that we won the games before we showed up there. Um, that's what I told my team. I told them that we, we didn't have to do anything amazing that weekend. We just need to be ourselves. Uh-huh. And I think hopefully that it relaxed everyone and allowed everyone to feel confident and comfortable with like, hey, we put in the work. Let's just have a good time and expect our best and that, that'll do the trick. So yeah, it was awesome. Very cool. Very cool. So I, I know you always you talked about your females and I've always heard like, especially for with a team, you always your, your females have to be like at least top notch to even make it to like make it further up with like, you know, winning first place or in the being on the podium. So how did you kind of like, I know you say you trained with them at all, but like, so how did you kind of like figure out like, okay, they're coming in here compared to like other people at your gym? Um, just the girls in general. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was one of those things where it's like, you know, so from a CrossFit perspective, there are a few things that you really need females to excel at. Um, especially when it comes to team, because it's very different than individual, right? And I say that because so much of the work we do as teams is on like external or odd objects that mm-hmm. aren't in a gym. So I need women to have tremendous work capacity. Um, I, I like sled work. I like their ability to put up power and mainly their ability to suffer. Um, and then on top of that, it's gymnastics, right? Like barbell strength, you can develop and we can be competitive in, but we can lose those events, mm-hmm. right? It's usually one one event, maybe two events out of 12 or 13 scores. Like I'm okay with middle of the pack finishes in those, yeah. especially if we can capitalize and win some workouts with high volume ring muscle ups, bar muscle ups, GHC sit ups, partner deadlifts. And then once we get to that warm in those sleds, like that's where we have to shine. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the same way with our males, right? Miss View had only been doing CrossFit about a year and a half before we showed up at the CrossFit games. Um, I mean, you talk about deer in the headlights. My man was just that yeah. blurred to him as, of an experience. Yeah. Uh, so that whole year for us was building a structure around Miss so that he was comfortable, mm-hmm. right? I wanted him to learn his limitations throughout the year. Here's an example for you. We we took all six of our members to Wadapalooza. At the time, it was only three male teams and three female teams. We got our butts kicked on both sides. And we had aspirations like, hey, we can go compete, maybe get on the podium. Because we just thought highly of ourselves that way in regards to fitness. Yeah. But what I didn't do is I didn't strategize anything with anyone. I wanted us to show up and just do our thing. We weren't clearly in the best shape for that and ready mm-hmm. but we want to have a good time and our women were so ticked that they're finished like i mean hot and heated it was the best thing that could have happened to our team yeah and then of course mitch got an opportunity to see side to side some of these guys he got to see the elijah muhammad and the noah olsons to his left and to his right and it he got to feel that experience at least prior to the games when we got there out there on the floor um and even though we got our butts kicked it was a good trip and then we came back with a long list of things that we needed to improve uh, predominantly knowing that we had to develop game plans for workouts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So I know you talked about like how you know you and Rich were like kind of jaw back and like you know jawing back and forth. So I've o- I've always asked questions with other people. So do you think like CrossFit needs to have like a bad a bad boy or a bad girl so they could be like like an enemy pretty much to all the rest of the uh, rest of the um, people? You know, I don't think you need to necessarily have a bad guy right but i think it's okay to healthily compete with one another yeah you know what i mean like with us with that hashtag it was frowned upon because in the crossfit community right one who goes after the champ literally people would comment on things that we post like how dare you guys go after him how dare you you know do this and that the way we felt was that 
everyone else is showing up to win. They're just afraid to put words to match it. Mm-hmm. Right? They, they say, you know, we're going to show up and do our best. Well, no, we're showing up to win, and that's what we want to do. We're competitors, and we're taking time away from our friends. We're taking time away from work to, like, to play fitness. So if we play fitness, we want to play to win. And, and because of the year that Mayhem had previously, that's why we targeted them that way. They were back-to-back champs. We, I didn't want them to get three in a row, so that's why we put a team together to begin with because I was like, hey, we won two in a row in 2012 and 2013. I can't let Rich have all these records and go get three in a row and be the first one to that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, which he probably will be, right? Like, he, <laughs> was it the third time in a row this year? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. I think, yeah, he's going yeah, for the I think he's going for the fourth one this year. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because we won 2017, they won 2018, 2019. But there wasn't oh, no, last no, year. No, no, no. So, yeah, this is the third one. So okay, this yeah. Be, this would be three in a row, where last year would have been for them anyways. But nonetheless, yeah, it's just been like, you know, that's why we did that. And that's what, you know, and I, and I shared that with them. And I made a bunch of smarky remarks like, hey, man, I'm just trying to take some pressure off, off you and your situation over there. <laughs> if you win everything, you know, that's got a lot of, that's a lot of stress. Yeah. Right? You know, and, and here's the beauty is when, when you do that, you do bring the best out of other competitors as long as it's in a respectful way, right? Like you don't got to be the guy slandering people or throwing them under the bus, but Hey man, when we show up, like we're going to show up to win. Um, and if you kick our butts then do it right, yeah. we're coming to try to kick yours. Uh, and, and I think, and I think rich, rich respected that. And he was a great competitor all weekend. Even when they, even when they got second, like people give him a hard time for, you know, being very sober and like straight face, but he congratulated us just like everyone else did. And uh, actually, before we even went out on the floor for the final workout, he literally approached me and was like, hey, you guys got a fit crew, man. Yeah. Like, he just, you know, he at that point, I think maybe he recognized was where the scores were that they couldn't pass us or whatever at that point. But mm-hmm. um, it was just, it, it was great. And, and like I said, um, he, he's a real winner and competitor in everything that he does. So why would he, why would he take that lightly? I'd look the same way. Yeah. I'd look the same way if we got second or third. So um, I completely understand that. And I think that, competition is great we see it within the community it's just not as verbal in crossfit and i think it's because of its origins right that community vibe within classes yeah so it's kind of almost you know we live in two worlds right and even as a coach i recognize that we got the classroom and then we got the competitors and they train differently they, they live a little bit differently and with good reason mm-hmm. yeah so speaking about coaching so how did you get involved with uh, brute strength yeah that's all from you crossfit and hacks pack man so because michael casio um, he essentially uh, dreamed this up himself, right? And so w- what I mean by that is he stepped out of competing in 2013, not really by choice, but because he had a lower back injury. Mm-hmm. Um, we might have kept our team together, maybe try to do another a, a third title back to go maybe 2014 had he not gotten hurt. But he had to get a pretty severe uh, surgery done for, I believe, what was categorized as lordosis, some severe lordosis in his lower back where his vertebrae wasn't stacked correctly. And he had to modify his training for that whole season in 2013, in fact, uh, because of that. But he was passionate about fitness, passionate about everything. At the time, he was studying his master's degree down at LSU. Then he saw that he didn't really want to do the commercial gym thing, right? Like, that was hard. It's a hard way to make a a good living. You can make a living if you got maybe an income coming from somewhere else. But to make that, and at the time, CrossFit was growing so fast and becoming so saturated in particular cities, especially here in Salt Lake City, mm-hmm. uh, that he was like, man, I don't, I don't know if I want that. But what we can do is, is, is offer something else. And at the time, while he was at LSU, he had worked with Matt Bruce. Matt Bruce is an all-America, everything weightlifter, and he'd been coaching people for many years. And so this expertise had kind of been lacking in our space where you get a specialist to help you with a particular area and blow that up. Mike had the 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 you know, the wherewithal to understand like, Hey, we bring on Matt Bruce. He's our Olympic weightlifting coach. Bring on Chris Henshaw as an endurance coach. And then we've got a specialist already in Nick Sorrell, who was a collegiate gymnastist and a doctor. So he has a very great mind in developing curriculum, ways to communicate, ways to teach video tutorials, that kind of thing. And we just made one program and that's what brute strength became. We put it on the backs of the, the kind of the, the fitness testimony we built at you. We used Tommy's name and face to kind of blow it up as well. My face as well. And I became, one of the generalist coaches. So fortunately enough, even what, I mean, we started late 2014 and I would say, what it's 2021. So, you know, seven years later, I'm still uh, the head coach of the brute compete program, which is for 60 to 90 minutes a day, kind of for the everyday Joe that wants a little more than just their gym programming, mm-hmm. uh, all the way to the games prep and masters program as well. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I, I love how you guys have like generalists because Obviously, like not a, not a lot of programs actually have generals, generalists in their programming like group. So, which I thought was like super cool. When I, I used to listen to 
uh, Kazu's like podcast for like a couple of years ago, and he always bring you know the other coaches in, just talking about like their specialty, which I thought was like super cool. Absolutely, and and I learned from those guys so much. Yeah, you know, like I really do. I learned from man. I learned so much from Chris Hinshaw when he was with us. I, I learned from Nick Sorrell. Um, I learned from Matt Bruce, and I still do to this day. Uh, and then what it allows me to do as a generalist is someone who has both competed on the team and individually. I'm now in the master's category from an age perspective. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I, I've kind of got that experience in the sport at its grassroots to be able to now manage some of the volume load from the weightlifting, some of the mechanical load from the gymnastics and be like, Hey guys, we got to drop two sets here. We got to take away one of these rounds or this is going to take too long. And then, we put together some of our conditioning through the eyes of myself and Nick Fowler. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So how long does it take you guys to do, do you guys do like a program like each, like every month or like, you know, just one day, just do a whole month of programming or what's, what's the whole process of that? That is a great question. So it's a big process, right? So with, with all the specialists, uh, essentially the order of operations is Nick Fowler creates a general template based off the time of year. Everything we do is periodized, right? Okay. Yep. Um, in order to peak people, the vast majority of people for the open. Now, we'll have some exceptions that we work with, the Brett Fikowskis, the Car Saunders, who they know they can punch their ticket through the open yep. to the next level at least without necessarily being peaked. Um, but for the vast majority of people, that's an important time. So he'll build out usually quarterly. So that means we get three-month chunks from him, mm -hmm. right? And then with that understanding, now this year was different because they changed everything on us again. So yeah. it's been more month to month than anything this year. Yeah. Uh, but from, from Nick, it goes to the strength aspect. So our strength coach goes in. He's doing exactly where our focuses need to be, whether we're working on strength endurance, whether it's power endurance, whether it's raw, one rep maxes, those kind of things. And he devises his program. Days of the week are set. He puts his, his things in. Then usually the gymnastics coach uh, and endurance coach can start to do their thing with like rowing intervals, running intervals, paces, uh, making it. And, you know, the unique thing about our pacing charts are that it's all based off of individual, you know, uh, speed. So yeah. if you run a... If you run a 110-400 and you run a 730 mile, your paces are based off of those things. Um, and so that's all customized, which is awesome. But we get that stuff set, and then I'm the last one, so or second to last one, I say. So I go in and I program our general Metcoms, right? Whether at the time of year we're working on you know, longer AMRAPs to work on general capacity and conditioning like in the off-season to match with strength work, or if we're working short sprint intervals that with short amount of rest, uh, or max effort rest, for example, as well, where we're going to start to blend that kind of training together as a traditional Metcon here, like we're in season now with open prep. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, we have worked with Active Life and Sean Pastouche for a very long time. So we get to use some of his protocols after the program is laid out to help our athletes recover uh, two to three days a week to help set themselves up for the, you know, all the, all the nicks and niggles that they can sometimes get from all the contractions or common contractions we put them through yeah so you you train uh brent fikowski so he's a taller individual and, I, and i'm six six myself so and I, so i wow. yeah so i mean i i started crossfit like seven years ago and it's so how do you like help train him because he's like six two six three roughly around there so yeah, he's about six two. yeah so how do you train him to kind of keep up with the shorter athletes you know, that's so there's a, there's a couple things you gotta understand. One is that Nick is his specific individual coach. Okay. Right? Yeah. So there'll be times where Nick will utilize us in regards to advice. Maybe he's struggling with uh, the old school Fran style workouts and he wants me to put a spin on some of the conditioning. So he'll reach out or, hey, see, could you send me 12 conditioning workouts that are really gonna challenge Brent? That, that kind of thing, right? Okay. Yeah. But the answer to that directly is that you have to take things into consideration like cycle time. And the way to train his contractions to be faster. Mm -hmm. So when you look at an athlete like Brent, he always came into the sport with like, hey, if it's a long chipper, he's run away with that thing. Yeah, right? yeah. He's got a large engine. He came from like a more endurance-based background, long and rangy. If you get him out in space and he has to move objects from side to side or here to there, he'll do well. But in a traditional thruster, or if it's light overhead squats and he's got to get done 40, beside Matt Frazier, who's also doing 40 and then 40 chest to bars, well, we know that even if they both go unbroken, Matt's going to come off that pull-up bar, you know, probably almost 18 seconds faster than Brent, no matter what happens. Yeah. Right. So some of his training is based off of 
can we cut down range of motion here? How do we develop the power and the horsepower in order to help the bottom of his squat turn around faster and make it more rapid? How do we shorten down the distance that he's traveling for chest bars? What can we work with his kip swing? So when you talk about details, a guy like that is dialed in so much you would lose your mind if you try to keep up, right? Yeah. And that's why he's got the professor project and the things that he's got going on because this is the way his mind works. So it certainly suits, I think. I think a lot of people that would struggle with that range of motion issue wouldn't care to put in that kind of time and he's he knows that it's all in the details for him yeah very cool very cool yeah because i always try to because i do workouts with like shorter individuals and then like i videotape myself on a couple workouts and i'm like i i stop for a quick second to take a break and i look at them I'm like what rep are you on and they're like almost doubled and then i'm like looking like one like one chest of our pull-up is like two of his and i, I was like yeah. all right i gotta figure out a way just to beat him like in the non-gymnastic style workouts so because i obviously i know gymnastic stuff is gonna take me a heck of a lot longer than to than this guy over here absolutely and and thomas the thing to remember about that is that so from a mathematical perspective you're winning the workout a lot of times if you're close because you're making a large load travel a longer distance yeah maybe not quite as quick but when it comes to that power equation that we go over so well at the level one if you think about it, like that range that you have to make 135 travel in a deadlift or a snatch or a squat snatch, it's so much further than even me at 5'11", way further than someone at 5'8", right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, just keep that in the back of your mind. Like, hey, my overall fitness is still going up. I might not win the the raw side of the time workout, but I'm making that weight travel even further. Yeah, yeah. For for some reason, I love thrusters. So that's like, that's my jam. Like, I don't know why, but... I don't. I, I I do. I I could hold on to that sucker for a very very long time. So it, it's. I don't know why I like it so much, but oh, oh well. So. Yeah, man. yeah, man. Look, God bless you for liking thrusters. I'll tell you, <laughs> they are not up on my on my listings. Now I know. Hey, they are one of the most effective ways to train anybody in anything. Oh yeah. So. Kudos to you for loving that movement. Yeah, I agree. So um, you talked about CrossFit level one. So how, how like obviously that's like a, a big part of CrossFit. So how did you get? How did they reach out to you? And like, are you still doing it, or like you know, what's the whole whole thing with that? Totally. Yeah. So I'm technically still on staff um, until they fire me, right? So <laughs> uh, and the way that works, it's all contracted work. You yeah. Know, if, if I have an opportunity to travel and be away from my family, and they want to hire me for a gig, they hire me for a gig. Now, there are people that wear those red shirts that do it week in and week out, like it's their full-time job, and some of them it is, you know, and they made, they've made careers out of it. For me, it was always a way to learn, stay connected, be a part of the community, and really spread something that I love so much, and, and I feel like exponentially helps change people's lives. Because if I could teach you, Thomas, and you can teach three, or if you could teach 10, or if you could teach 20, right, like that, I, I got to have a hand in that. Um, and so with that being said, um, it, back in 2013, Tommy brought up to me that he had struggled with trying to become level one staff, but that he thought I might make a good fit. So a super, super humble position for him. He was like, Hey man, I don't, I don't think that gigs for me. Um, I just, you know, he, he just didn't really have the personality for it. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because it's one thing to have the knowledge and know the knowledge. And it's a tremendously different thing to also run an amazing class than it is to give a, give a lecture or to run an amazing seminar. And so with that being said, he was like, Hey, you should, you should shoot, shoot Dave an email, uh, CC me in on it. Literally just Dave Castro. And I'm like, shoot Dave Castro an email. He's like, yeah, he'll remember you. And I was like, okay. And I think he might've said something like, well, how many black guys do you think have won the CrossFit games? He'll remember you. So luckily I was like, cool. I'll send him an email. I'll let him know I'm interested. So I did CC Tommy. Dave got back to me very quickly. And he was like, Hey, do you have your level two? Um, if not, that's something we can help you get. You just got to show up to the next thing. And all of a sudden, like I'm, I'm, you know, my wife gets home from her real job because at the time I'm like just a, a bum coach that's working a few hours a day and training all day. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gets home from a real job, and I'm like, I think, I think I might be going somewhere this weekend. I have to go get this level two. I might have a chance to, you know, work for CrossFit. So she's very supportive of that. I book a flight to California. Luckily enough, it was in Aroma, so I got to build some a legendary. Uh, memories working out there uh, where the original CrossFit Games happened. I got my level two. And basically the whole time, and I wasn't aware of this at the time, is that Dave had told every trainer um, that was teaching the level two that I was being vetted for that process, right? So yeah. they had they had kind of like almost allowed me to, they, they pushed me in and let me get that level two for free, which I'm, you know, indebted to forever. And uh, they, were, they were kind of weeding me out in a way, asking me a lot of questions and putting me on the spot a lot. And uh, fortunately enough, that was a success. Great memories. 
and uh, I got an opportunity then to start interning. Now, this intern process, I don't know if you've heard about what this is like. No, I haven't. But it is, it is a challenging, it is a challenging process. The way it works is you show up to one level one with no warning. They don't tell you what's going on, man. And now I will also say it's changed over the years. Mm-hmm. They, they've gotten a little soft and much more professional, which I don't know if I like as much. It's not as ruthless. <laughs> yeah. But they, uh, and it's not that they're hazing us, right? They're, they're, they're great people, but you know, you're, you're having to do some off the wall tasks. I'm fortunate enough that Eric O'Connor, Chris Spieler, and at the time Doug Zarakis was also interning who are all amazing trainers up here in Park City. So I went and I, I interned there first. And uh, I was under Eric's tutelage, and basically I followed him around like a shadow. Mm -hmm. I took more notes than I could handle, my hands cramping up all day, you know, I'm paying attention, doing anything they need. Hey, you need some water before you lecture. Hey, whatever you need, right, I'm here. Like, like, I'm the guy. And so, you know, I just wanted to show them that I was a team guy, right? Um, And uh, and then, you know, Eric's like, hey, dude, I think you'll make a great fit. Um, What you want to do is look at the schedule. Dave will get you set up with a date that works, and you might have to fly somewhere for the next one because you can't do it under me. It has to be someone else. Yeah. So in about two weeks, I get a flight to Florida, and I intern under Chuck Carswell, the legend himself, uh, the man, the myth, the legend. If you guys don't know who Chuck is, you need to look into him. Uh, I don't think he has social media. I don't know how he sustained this ability to this day, but uh, he played football at Georgia. He was a stud, and he is the man when it comes to L1s. He's, he's worked more L1s than anyone. Um, I, I think they did a I think they did a video on the Buttery Bros. He was yeah, I think with like the uh, Eric when Eric Rosa was recertifying and then they made the Buttery Bros recertif. I think he was the coach for that that YouTube video. It wouldn't surprise me that no one other than him would lead that level one with now the the owner of CrossFit. So yeah, no surprise there. Um, Chuck is an amazing dude. I admire him a ton. And and so what that process though is like, so you understand is like so that first seminar went from doing nothing, and then that next seminar. You know, I show up on Saturday morning early to the gym in a foreign city I've never been to, at a gym I've never been to. And Chuck's like, hey, how you doing? Ask me a couple personal questions. He's like, I'm going to have you teach the squats group today, and I'll be watching you, you know, and that's it. And then you just roll, and you do your thing. And so it's really and, – and they'll step in and help you if you're ruining someone's experience because clearly people pay $1,000 for this, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they critique you. They kind of critique your every move. They, they watch how you – how you watch movement, they, they watch how you teach movement, the way you use your body, the way you use your voice and space. Do you make everyone feel feel involved all the time? Um, how do you coach across the room to people? Um, it was a phenomenal and eye-opening experience for me as a leader, as a coach. And, uh, you know, he passed me forward, luckily enough. And then my next one was with Cherie Chan, uh, also another legend, a woman that extremely intimidated me at the time because uh, you just never knew what she was thinking. She was pretty yeah. quiet, pretty reserved. Very serious faces watching me the whole time. Like, yep. <laughs> you know, not, not much right at all. And uh, to wrap that up quickly, I'll, I'll share is that at the end of that was in Texas. At the end of that seminar, you know, she sat down, sat me down and let me have it, man. She told me a full list of things that I need to do better, uh, ways that I need to step up and, and improve uh, seeing movement, changing movement, being more relentless, more ruthless, not saying good when it wasn't good, not saying fluff words, you know. And, uh, and then at the end of the conversation, lo and behold, surprise to, to me, she was like, and you're going to make a great fit. I'm giving you the green light. I think you should be a part of the, the CrossFit staff, you know. And, and at that point, that opened my eyes to everything. I was like, wow. So she just gave me all this feedback on things I need to do better. And yet she thinks I'm going to make an amazing fit to this team. Oh, this is these are my people. This is who I want to be around. Right? Yeah. They're going to get the most out of me. Yeah. And so uh, I got the green light. And, man, I worked my first gig probably like two and a half weeks later, uh, about a week before the CrossFit Games in 2013. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, um, what are you, what are your thoughts on like the online L one classes now? Man, I'll tell you what. It's 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 a great pivot and a great move that CrossFit had to make. Yeah. Um. No question. Mm-hmm. No question. And I think they've done it in such a way that it it hasn't cheapened the experience. Mm-hmm. However, um, it's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same, right? For you to get that exposure to that in person correction from me or from, uh, you know, uh. Matt Chan or Sheree Chan or Doug Zarakis or Eric O'Connor, right? To feel their presence and attitude, to watch how they fix someone else across the circle, like some of that is very muted. Even though you get a little bit of that experience on the screen, it's not the same. So yeah. I think they're doing a great job with it now. I think they do have a lot of seminars that are still happening in much smaller groups. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't worked a seminar in almost a year now coming up, um, and it's it's been it's I miss it. 
I miss it, right? But it's also kind of nice to be able to dive in, headfirst into FNX, the other things I got going on, and know that I got weekends with my family as well. Yeah. So speaking about FNX, this is the one thing I wanted to get involved in. So I know I I, I was I think I heard on a, a Barbell Shrug podcast like this guy met like I don't know if it's a mutual friend like he met up with you and said, hey, I got a supplement company, and I kind of want to get you involved. How how did FNX work? Yeah. So the guy that you're talking about, his name is Skylar Farns, and he is currently uh, another co-founder, and he's the CEO. He's the one that dreamed up FNX before it was started. And uh, at first when we met, it was really that. It was a dream. It Mm -hmm. was a design behind a label and uh, a couple products that he had in mind to launch because he loved CrossFit. Came, He's kind of a serial entrepreneur. He's a very young young dude, hungry. But his family are are a series of entrepreneurs. Um, Like, I mean, if you... If, if you want to take a stab at some businesses that they're involved in, there probably are. Yeah. And so with that being said, he's got a wonderful knowledge of things, uh, things that I have no understanding. And at the time I had no curiosities about, but what I did know was fitness. And so he approached me more as like, Hey, I'd like to use you as the brand of this thing. I'd like to use you as a face and maybe sponsor your team to the 2017 games. And, you know, allow that to be the catalyst for this brand to jump off. Um, and all, all that happened essentially was through the, the year of 2016 is I'm putting this team together and we start working together. We're starting making some posts. We're trying to dream up some of these things. I started to suggest as much as I can to him ways that I might think that uh, product design can work that will appeal to the CrossFit masses and athletes in general uh, connections that I suggest he start to bridge and connections that I could help him make myself. And uh, before you knew it, man, in a few months we were partners, you know, we were business partners. And so, you know, when we fast forward now, when we show up to the CrossFit games, we've got, a relatively complete line of products, at least we thought at the time. Now, compared to that, it's, it was very small, but we had some cricket protein uh, for people that struggle with lactose intolerance and wanted a whole source of food. Mm-hmm. We had a whey protein, and we had uh, as well, you know, some pre-workouts and BCAAs. Uh, we launched the CrossFit game, and fortunately enough, because of our success, we really used that as a, as a diving board um, or catalyst to momentum into the CrossFit space uh, in 2017. Yeah. Very cool. So, and I know you guys have an ambassador. I know, like, you have an ambassador program too. So, how how is that going, and how did that come about? Yeah, man, that's that's all. Uh, you know, my background in sports, right, and and my desire to connect with people. Um, I, I hope the audience feels some of this presence and and excitement through the through the audio that they're experiencing or if they're watching it. But like, I'm a I'm a people person. I enjoy helping people through whatever it is that they're facing. I've experienced a lot as an individual. And, and I listen, so I've learned a lot as an individual. And with that being said, there was no better way for us to bridge this gap in who we are, FNX, which embodies and stands for a phoenix, right, that rises from the ashes, mm-hmm. uh, for us to create partnerships with individuals that actually love our stuff. And so if we can find those people, and then those people are passionate like we are, that's really one of the reasons we had the early success that we did and were able to grow so quickly was because people try our products, they become ambassadors, they get an opportunity now to share code and, you know, if they want it to be very involved, they can make some money for themselves on the side. But if they just want to be a part of a great brand that, you know, we do things like bi-weekly lives and educational content on our products so they can speak to them and understand them uh, in greater detail. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, not within the last year, but in the absence of COVID, man, we did some really great uh, ambassador retreats where we get our athletes that we sponsor here. We get some ambassadors from around the United States and we have great times together for three or four days and build some memories. So. That, I think that's really where it originated, to be honest, was our, our yearning to connect and build community. Very cool. And then I know you guys donate to it. Like, you have a charity. So each product that you buy, um, you give a, a clean gallon of water to a child, So, which I thought was super cool. And so how did how did that come about? Like, Because obviously with me, with my T-shirt company, you donate to the Children's Diabetes Foundation. Like, I always wanted to, you know, kind of have the charity work with kids because you know they're they're important. They're like they're young. They don't know any better, and to kind of make them you know better or help them out would would help them out in the would help out in the long run. Yeah, no, no question. And 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 this program that you're alluding to for us then is called Live in Victory Every Day, um, otherwise known as the Live Program. And so yes, it it allows us to provide for every item, not just every order, right? But we're talking every item in an order. So mm-hmm. if you buy a hat, you buy a T-shirt, you buy some BCAs, you buy you buy, uh, you know, some pre-workout and some greens, like five items, 
you're down, donating five gallons of water, the equivalent thereof. And what we do is we put that into fruition by yearly being a part of building wells there. Um, so, and, and, and it was one thing, you know, for us to think about, we, we needed to have a purpose that's greater than money, that's greater than building a legacy for ourselves or for our families. It was like, we want to, you know, we want to be able to actually create change in lives and, and give that. And and all of us as founders, we're, we're very fortunate to be like-minded spiritually, where it's just like, hey, we wanted this to be something much greater uh, than about us and about some supplements. So mm-hmm. uh, that was what we chose. And a lot of people don't know and aren't aware, but literally just over a quarter of the world still doesn't have access to, to running water like we do and we can take so easily for granted. So um, we thought there was no better way, honestly, right? People use water to take our products, at least most of them. And so it was a great kind of hand-in-hand uh, relation with what we created with the Live program. Yeah, very cool. I, I, I love that idea that you guys do. So I, I really do love it. So... Um, so I know that you're like super, super busy with like, you know, coaching. You own a gym too, I believe still, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm also a co-owner of a gym, but the beauty of that, to be honest with you, is that I don't do much there at all, right? I show up to train now. Yeah. Now, before COVID hit, I was still coaching some classes. I was still programming for the gym, but since COVID, I've stepped back. I've allowed the, our, some of our partners that, that also have ownership, they're managing and running the gym uh, at, at full reign right now. So they're doing their thing. We use it. We use the gym space to train. And, of course, I'm still a partner, so I'm still involved. Uh, and I'll try to show up and maybe hit a class every now and again. But it doesn't really take much time for my – you know, my, my daily brain equity, I'll say it's not, it's yeah. not living a ton of space in my head, which I'm very fortunate for. Mm-hmm. They do a great job running that gym. Very cool. So how do you handle such a busy schedule that you have, including with like training, you know, family time and then business wise, like how do you kind of separate all three? It's, it's very hard for me to say that I separate all three and do it well, <laughs> but I try to, you know, and so what that means is, and, and I've made a post about this pretty recently, is I think there's an art to compartmentalizing our lives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing that I learned early on in 2017, and I'm talking, this is like two weeks right after the CrossFit Games, is that uh, I had to make a list for myself. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times one of the applicables that I suggest everybody that's busy, quote unquote busy, because we're all busy, do is that maybe the night before you, you provide yourself a list with where you're going to spend your time or the tasks that you need to get done that next day. And for me, especially through COVID, it was extremely important because I wasn't going to the office every day anymore. In fact, there was a period where none of us were in the office at all. So days were filled with Zoom meetings and it felt all over the place because our kids were here. My wife was stepping out of work to make sure that she could stay home with the kids because we weren't st- sending them to child care anymore at yeah. school. Yeah. And so life was just upended. And so with that being considered, it was like that really, really showed me the value at that point. It was like, okay, if I know I got to do these 12 things, I had to communicate with my wife the night before, hey, I'm going to have to be down in the office at you know, this time to this time. Then I've got another Zoom at this time. If you want to work out at this time, I'll come mind the children or you know, maybe we can work out together at lunch while they're napping. So it was a lot of that coordination. And uh, that's where I still find success in doing. So, for example, if, uh, you know, tomorrow's a work day, I know who I need to meet with, what time those meetings are going to be. So I put those down on my paper first because those are concrete staples that have to happen. Yeah. Then after that, it might be, you know, uh, diving into some of our social media outreach. Where are we at with sponsorships, checking in on athletes, making sure orders are going to the people that are voices and faces for us. Um, and then it might be, hey, we know we also have to plan for our lives next week because we go live about three times a week in our Facebook group mm-hmm. um, that will also start to appear as an FNX podcast as well. But, you know, preparing that kind of content, because that's really important, uh, especially for the people who are already our ambassadors. So um, that, that's kind of how I structure my days. It's like priority, must have concrete lists, and then you get some variability in some of the other tasks. But then time to manage from, from there on up. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So um, we're getting close to the end. So... Um, just a couple quick questions. So, um, do you, do you have any like goals that you're planning to hit in 2021? Like it could either be business, like personal or pretty much like, you know, fitness wise, or are you planning to like go back to team? Are you, do you have any ambitions to go and doing the master's division at all? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely participate in the open and that's what I share with everyone, right? It takes, it takes, uh, for, for me to like make an open statement, like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to make it back to the CrossFit games. Would, would I love for that to happen? Yes. As long as my wife gives me permission, right? Because that's a whole nother, yeah. that's a whole nother thing. You got two kids and you got to be considered competing at CrossFit is selfish, yeah. right? No matter how anyone makes it seem, it's like, I get to be on that journey. Does my wife get to go and does she find some enjoyment in it? Or does she hope for my success? Absolutely. Will my kids have a good time? Sure. Does my family enjoy it? Absolutely. But also that's, that's a hard process. You know, you, you go for a trip and you sit around and watch someone, exercise for six to eight hours a day well that is not the life yeah and so with that being said 
Um, that has to do with a lot of my, my family's situation, circumstance, also COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and so from a business perspective, uh, you know, I think, I think we're, we're walking it out right now. We just moved into a new facility. Um, we're growing our, we're growing our, uh, coaching staff there or what we could call consultants. Um, because essentially that's what, that's the hat that our salesman wear at FNX is they're walking people through the benefit of whatever their lifestyle and training look like and dialing them into the products that they could actually use in their lives. So we're building that out. Um, we started a challenge this year that kicked off amazingly. We got about 300 and almost 50 people participating in a challenge called Rise 45, uh, which is essentially 45 days to, to new habits and disciplines. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, m- myself and, and Dan Hooper dreamed up this program sometime during the summer, and we just we sat on it and developed it until kicking off the new year. And I, I think a lot of people are getting benefits from it. So. We're already planning the next iteration of that, which will happen probably about three times annually. Um, we'd like to see, and uh, you know, man, I think I think it's not like a hard number. It's not like, hey, I want to hit X number. It's not that I want to go to the CrossFit Games, but really, this year, what I'm what I'm hoping for is to find new ways to serve our ambassadors, uh-huh. um, and to hopefully. And this has less to do with our control than anything, but to be able to connect with them in person, man, I'd love to get this vaccine distributed and get people more confident and comfortable with me together and just be able to hang out. I miss that. I miss that aspect of it for sure. So, yeah. Um, that's about it. I, I can't hit you with a ton of goals. I'm going to do my best in everything that I'm a part of. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I'm a participant in Rise 45, so there's disciplines that I'm practicing right now that I just want to see through. Like I'm tracking my macros. I haven't done that for years. I'm making sure I'm, I'm hydrating with a particular amount of water every single day. Um, I'm, I'm making sure that I'm investing in myself every day in regards to some mindset or mentality. And that could be like, you know, listening to a podcast like this with, with your show, or it could be, uh, you know, reading my Bible or reading a book. So mm-hmm. there's some things that I really hope to cling to throughout 2021. And I think then that'll put me in a place to achieve some cool stuff. Very cool. Very cool. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So, um, I kind of, I kind of stole this from, uh, Mike Cashew's podcast. So do you have a favorite book that you like to give out or, or like, do you, do you like to read at all? Man, I, I do read, but it's few and far between, to be honest with yeah. you. And the bulk of it is is surrounding spirituality, especially now that I, I, I still coach, uh, but, but so much of it is different, right? It's leadership, spirituality. It helps keep me composed and keep my head on straight. And so there's a there's a great book by the author, I believe, is David Platt. I could be wrong. I might be butchering this, guys, but look up the title, Not a Fan. Um, and it taught me a lot of things, not just spiritually even, it, just about life and mm-hmm. about opinions and about where your thoughts and emotions lie versus actually where your actions lie. And so the encouragement through that book is to uh, get in the game, right? Don't be a fan. Don't be someone in the stands and giving your opinion. Don't be someone just standing up and clapping or booing from the sideline. Like get in the game. And if you have an opinion about something, be involved in changing it or creating it. Um, and I think clearly, you know, the book kind of focuses on from a spiritual aspect of that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. To, to be there, to walk it out, to live it out, and not be a fan of who Christ is, but to actually know him mm-hmm. uh, and walk that out. So it was a cool, cool book, and, and that's probably the one that I'd suggest. And I, man, this is a long time coming. I read that book probably in, for the first time, I read it the first time probably in 2011. Uh, and, I, and I still been making that strongest suggestion from here on out. Now, there's a bunch of great ones. Mindset, Carol Dweck. There's, there's so many books that are going to help people, uh, but that's the one I'll suggest to guys. Okay, very cool. So, um, I know you kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Well, actually, before that. So, how how old are your kids? Uh, three and one. Oh, okay. You got really, really young ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Soon to be four and two. Yeah, because I I was just gonna ask you because um I wasn't quite sure. So my my five year old son he's starting to like because I work out in the basement, and so he's starting to kind of get involved with me. So like we use like I have. I have like a lacrosse stick that I use. He uses it for like a back squat when he back squats or like he does like little clean and jerks or snatches. So, um, I do. You, I'm, so that was going to ask you if, if like, you know, are you kind of like leaning your kids into like working out or kind of like, what are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, having them train with you? Yeah, I think, I think one day the, the time will be there right now. Uh, they don't spend a lot of time in the garage with me or Momo because we're trying to get our workout in and get back in. Yeah, right? yeah. So, but what I do, I, I you know, we're, we're always playing around, we're horsing around, we're running, we're jumping as high as we can, we're, um, you know, we're doing forward rolls, we're trying to do headstands on the carpet. So it's more play and use your body in space. Yeah. Um, you know, so much of what I say, and don't hold me to this, guys, but I do my best is surrounding hard work. You know, so it's like, hey, you know, how come he's doing that, that, that? And I say, you know, he gets to do that because he works really hard. But um, we were watching, we were watching White Fang this morning, right? And White Fang, if you guys don't know, it's a, there's a cartoon version of White Fang. 
uh, and uh, he's watching this dog lead this pack, and he's like, how come he's in front? And I say, you know, it's just because he's the hardest worker, and so he's earned that ability, and so I don't want him to think, oh, he's the fastest, so yeah. it's this reward. It's more like, hey, you put in the work, you put in the time, and so I think a lot of hopefully what I'm passing down to them is that it, everything that you want takes work, and you got to be the hardest worker in the room if you want it. If they want that to be fitness, or they want it to be football or basketball or soccer or something, if they want it to be accounting, hopefully it just translates. Uh, but yeah, we're doing, they'll do some push-ups and sit-ups randomly. Yeah. And it's funny where they get some of this stuff from, because I really don't remember ever being like, hey, this is a push-up, watch me do this, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. And they're just doing them, so it, it's fun to see. Yeah, I, I'm going to I'm gonna steal the hard work thing from you, so I hope that's okay. Dude, yeah, yeah, I love that idea. Love that idea. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So, um, last two questions. So, let's just say you have a new person that wants to get into CrossFit and go to the CrossFit Games. I know you kind of talked about it earlier, but... What would you tell them, like, what to expect? Um, boy, that is a hard question right there, let me tell you. Because, boy, I go on some tangents. So to keep it concise, what I do is I'm very honest with people. Um, and I ask them, like, do you really want it? And then the first thing that I ask them is, what is it going to take for you? Mm-hmm. Because I need them to tell me. Nothing I tell them is going to help them. Not one thing. Not one thing I say. So if they don't already know what it's going to take, Um, and are ready, then they shouldn't say they want to go to the CrossFit Games, right? And so I have that conversation right out the gate. And a lot of people aren't happy with that. But if they can stand there and take that heat a little bit for the time being and then can tell me what they think they'll need to commit to, then I'll have that conversation and I'll I'll maybe correct them in certain ways or just tell them like, hey, to have this perspective. But the one piece of advice that I do offer is that, uh, you know, and this is a quote I share pretty commonly is take your time. It takes time. Mm. And that's with anything that you want to accomplish. It's where we're at this point in the sport where it's not like, you know, for me in 2011, man, my first three months of CrossFit, I qualified for regional second in the Southwest. That's insane. I had a life, yeah. lifetime of, uh, you know, football background and I loved to suffer. Yeah. I had no skills. Mm-hmm. So when it came to butterfly pull-ups or handstand push-ups at regionals and, and ring muscle-ups and squat snatches, like I didn't do that great. I still finished sixth, but literally it was only because I had a lifetime of like really hard work. Mm-hmm. And then I had this long, steep curve to like learn the skills or learn how to pace and all that. So for them, I tell them like the, the sport's very different than it was 10 years ago. And this is what the journey is going to look like. Don't be thinking about the CrossFit Games every day. You think about tomorrow. You know, yeah. t- t- take today and think about today. Then take tomorrow and we think about tomorrow. And then all of a sudden, you know, two years from now, we find ourselves thrown down in your scores. Are reflecting your hard work in the open, like we're gonna build some cool momentum. So take your time; it takes time. That's what I got. Yeah, one one percent every day. That's it. I love it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's it. awesome, hey, man. And sometimes it ain't even one percent. Yep, yeah, that's true. That's true. So, um, where can people like reach out to you if they have any questions with like FNX or brute strength or like uh, any just general question for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm great. I try to be great on uh, Instagram. I try to be on there quite a bit. I mean, that's kind of the back. The backbones of how we built our company was through Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Adrian Conway underscore is my is my uh, handle. So you guys can shoot me a DM there. Um, feel free. I'd love to engage in conversation, talk about supplements, talk about training. And then if they're interested in like being an athlete for me or looking for one on one coaching or have questions about Brute, we'll probably take a conversation to email out to that. Yeah. Uh, but feel free. Social media is, is a great place. Um, and on Facebook, I think I can, I think I have some, some space for some friends for a while. It's like, you know, how it's full or whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think I do have some face. So I'm, I'm on Facebook as well. So Adrian Conway there, but yeah, DM, DM is great. All right. Awesome. Well, well, thank you very much for, you know, taking your time on doing this podcast with me. I really do appreciate it. And I loved your learning about your whole experience in the CrossFit space and the supplement space and even being a dad too, which is, you know, really important to me too as well. So thank you very much for doing this. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And I'll leave you guys with this too. I I do have a podcast that I started in October called Rise and Pod with Adrian Conway. So something else that you can follow me on, I suppose. It's uh, it's on all the major platforms. So five days a week, I got some kind of content there and it's short. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. I'm I'm actually going to subscribe today. So I'll I'll do that for you. So awesome. I hit hit, hit episode 100 on uh, Friday this week. Damn, good for you. Yeah, I've started this. I started this like a year and a half, like not like a year, year and a month ago. And it was like spur of the moment. So, and like I'm almost at 100 right now. So, oh, dude. yeah. That's awesome. You're crushing it. Yeah, I'm trying. Does every episode have a guest like myself? Uh, so I do. I have one guest a week, and then I have, a, I, have I do two episodes a week. So, the, the okay. I have one on Tuesday with a guest like yourself. And then Tuesday is kind of like, you know, it's, I call it the liftoff. So, it's like all about like news in the fitness space, my experience with diabetes, or like anything coming up where. 
you know, talk about my next guest and whatnot and, you know, just do that. Because, like, obviously, like, they hear about your experience and they don't know anything about me. So I thought that, you know, maybe having the liftoff, getting a little people to, you know, actually get to know me a little bit more. 100%. You're killing it, man. I love it. I'm going to have to subscribe myself. Appreciate it. So thank you very much and I'll, and I'll catch you later, okay? Thank you. Thank you.